Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our uh, April Cocktail Judaism program. This is our first uh, program of the spring season, and uh, we are delighted to welcome you back. We have a very dear and very uh, honored guest this evening, Professor James Madison, whom I will introduce momentarily. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is our monthly cocktail Judaism. So whatever it is that you might be drinking, let's say Chaim and uh, to health and uh, joys as we enter uh, spring. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our special guest, Professor James Madison is the Thomas and Catherine Miller, Professor Emeritus of History at Indiana University. He's an award-winning teacher. Uh, Professor Madison is the author of several books, including Eli Lilly, A Life, Slinging Donuts for the Boys, An American Woman in World War II. That's the story of Elizabeth Richardson, uh, a Red Cross American worker in Europe during the war. Uh, he is the author of Hoosiers, A New History of Indiana. And many of you will remember that we had Professor Madison speak to us a couple of years ago during our Yom Kippur afternoon discussion uh, at Congregation Beth El Tzedek on that book. Uh, he's also the author of A Lynching in the Heartland, Race and Memory in America. Recently, Professor Madison was honored by the Midwestern History Association with the Frederick Jackson Turner Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, he's a dear friend of Sandy's and mine, and we have the uh, privilege of serving together on a few boards. Um, most recently, Dr. Madison is the author of The Ku Klux Klan in the Heartland, and it is about that that he will be conversing tonight. He will talk with us about the Klan, of the 1920s, its goals, its methods, its members and opponents, and its place in the larger contexts uh, of our state and regional and national history down to our own time. So for those of you who don't have the book, I hope that you will wanna get it immediately after the program and uh, fill in the uh, spaces that, uh, and the, and the, the uh, interesting notes that Jim will leave with us tonight. Well, Jim, you begin, may I call you Jim for the conversation? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely Dennis. Thank you. <laughs> you may call him, you may call Sandy Rabbi oh, Sasso, yeah. <laughs> and you can call me whatever you want. Uh, your book begins, the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s was as dark as the night and as American as apple pie. Uh, would you elaborate that seemingly contradictory statement as you talk to us tonight? So please take it from there and enlighten us, and then we will leave some time for Q&A and conversation. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, I'm going to start with some, uh, some slides here. Uh, as soon as we get them going. There we are. Um, and uh, thank you, Dennis, for inviting me. Thank you all for coming out on a beautiful early spring evening. Look, I am, but I'm, I'm drinking water because I need all my wits about me to do this. So maybe afterward, I'll have my, uh, my cocktail. This is a tough subject. And uh, we Americans have some difficulties with tough subjects, unlike Europeans and many other people in the world. That's an interesting subject. Maybe you want to talk about that later. But Americans tend to like their history in happy flavors, in rainbow colors of sunny skies. We tend, when we have unhappy stories, to just ignore them. And just if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. It'll be OK. And for 100 years, that's what most Hoosiers did with the stories of the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana and in America. Or even worse, we create alternative stories. We make up stories uh, that, that make us feel good, that are, are patriotic as the former president uh, called for, 
that really are fake history. That won't work. Neither of these will work because the fact is every county in Indiana had a clan cavern and some like Hamilton County had more than one, quite a few. This story is not a story of marginal people on the sidebars of our textbooks. It is a mainstream story right in the center of our history, right in the wheelhouse of American history. And Dennis smartly got the main point of this book. Here they are marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in the summer of 1925. As dark as the night, yes, but as American as apple pie. And that is not a contradiction. Uh, that is uh, the major reason, uh, the major argument of this book. And so tonight I'm gonna try to sketch out some of the high points very quickly, uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, with a lot of slides and move very quickly so that we do have time for, for discussion, for question, and for you to disagree with me because that's your right as an American citizen. We have to clear a little bit of uh, debris out of the way. First, I, I'm interested mostly in the, the second clan of the 1920s. There's one before only a Southern clan designed to keep newly emancipated slaves in their place, a horrible, violent organization. And then there's this third clan that appears in the 1960s and down to our own time. And I'll say, say a little bit about this later on, but I really wanna focus on the clan of the 1920s, the most powerful, the most important, the most mainstream of these organizations, a national organization, not just a Southern organization from New Jersey and New York across the Midwest where the clan was very powerful and popular to Oregon and California, a mainstream, American movement. And so the question immediately is who joined this Ku Klux Klan? Who were these people behind the mask? There's been lots of good scholarship in recent years and we now can answer that question. Unlike as recently as 20 years ago, the answer commonly was, well, they're rubes, they're the unwashed, they're the marginal people, they're hillbillies. And if that's true, then we don't have to pay attention to them because they are not us. They are not good Hoosiers. They are not good Americans. They're the great unteachables. That's not true. The people who joined the Klan in Indiana were good Hoosiers, middle-class, mainstream, lawyers and dentists and doctors and church women and ministers, lots of Protestant ministers, ordinary Hoosiers from all parts of Indiana, cities and towns and farms. They were united in their belief that they were 100% Americans. And I submit to you, obviously, this is a very, very slippery slope downhill. Once we decide that some of us are 100% Americans and therefore others of us are not. These 100% Americans self-defined were all white, native born and Protestant. That triangle is at the center of the Klan movement. The Protestant part was especially important and meaningful because the Protestant churches, the mainstream Protestant churches, Methodists, Disciples of Christ, Presbyterians, Baptists, entered into an alliance with the Klan and the Klan entered into alliance with them, both believing it would be mutually beneficial. This is the Klan insignia, the blood of Christ in the center, other Christian symbolism around it. And so on Sunday mornings across Indiana, robed Klan members would march into a church down the center aisle and put on the altar an offering of cash, while the choir and the congregation sang Onward Christian Soldiers, one of the great hymns of the Ku Klux Klan and the Protestant Church. That Protestantism is fired by anti-Catholicism. Now, this is a hard concept for many Americans today. They're not really familiar with it. Some of you will remember perhaps the 1960 election and John Kennedy as a Catholic candidate. But American history is full of anti-Catholicism. It's brought across the Atlantic in the first ships that land in Massachusetts and Jamestown. And it's deep and powerful 
And it is especially powerful in the 1920s when <clears throat> Protestants were very much fearful and anxious about this foreign church with a foreign pope and celibate priests and parochial schools and all sorts of other things that were dangerous to America. And so Catholic conspiracies about what Catholics were up to uh, raged across the land uh, long before uh, uh, QAnon and other present day conspiracies. The Klan was responsible <clears throat> for this particular act of violence in a small town in Northwestern Indiana. They bombed a Catholic parsonage. There was no life lost, but significant damage. And I mention this because there was other violence against the Klan enemies, but not much of it. The violence that the Klan uh, took on in Indiana in the 1920s was limited. The Klan murdered no one in Indiana in the 1920s, lynched no one. We have no documented evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, the violence was very, very limited because the Klan leadership and its members believed that they were good Hoosiers. They were normal Hoosiers. They didn't want to be seen as some kind of, of violent outcasts. They wanted to be in charge by peaceful and legitimate reasons. So the violence is there, the intimidation certainly is there, that's a very important part of it, but not the kind of violence that is commonly assumed to have been part of the Klan in India. Another enemy are immigrants, and of course it's the same in many cases as Catholics, because many Catholics are immigrants or the children of immigrants. Uh, strong anti-foreign prejudice that grows in the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, that leads to calls for restriction on immigration. The Klan is in the forefront of those calls and is very much pushing this piece of legislation that passes Congress in 1924, the National Origins Quota Act, which sets a quota on those immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe compared to immigrants from Western and Northern Europe. And the immigrants that are really the source of concern here are of course from Poland, uh, from, from Italy, from Sicily. These immigrants, these immigrants, these people are never gonna become Americans. They'll never be 100%. There's some doubt among the Klan uh, people that they're ever gonna be white. Uh, simply not suited for American, these very, very foreign people from Eastern and Southern Europe. And so this bill, this law discriminates deeply against them. And for Asian immigrants, uh, provides a quota of zero. None are going to enter the United States from Asia. This 1924 act stays on the books in America until 1965. A great Klan victory. Of course, Jews are the enemy. Anti-Semitism has a long, long history from the very beginning of America. Again, brought over in those first immigrant, those first ships. Uh, it waxes and wanes. It becomes especially powerful in the 1920s at a national level, Henry Ford's Billboard Independent fueling the fires. This is the time when many Ivy League schools uh, instituted quota systems. Uh, uh, Anti-Semitism is, is, is repeated throughout the Klan's uh, organizing, propagandizing, speaking activities. One of the things the Klan promises is that the, they'll force Jewish businesses out uh, by boycotting them. Uh, that was mostly hot air, but it was a common point made by Klan speakers. Uh, maybe the most interesting, one of the best of them all was this very interesting woman, Daisy Douglas Barr, a Quaker minister, the first vice chair of the Indiana Republican Party, uh, and a very, very charismatic Klan leader. And you know that African Americans have to be the enemy for these people, these white 100% Americans. Uh, I illustrate that with this great, great film. It's a film every American should see if you haven't. Uh, it's a brilliant piece of early filmmaking, but it's also a brilliant piece of horrible, racist stereotyping and propaganda. The Klan showed this film in downtown movie theaters across Indiana in churches and other venues as a major recruiting device for its members. <clears throat> So these are the enemies, Catholics, immigrants, Jews, African-Americans, <clears throat> put them all in a raft and sink them to the bottom of ocean, this speaker says. This all is exacerbated by the new best science of the day. This is the science of eugenics. 
Uh, in the early 20th century, scientists from Yale to Stanford to Indiana University discovered biological differences, racial hierarchies. Not surprisingly, the white folks were at the very top and you go down the hierarchy, the darker the skin, the less fit the human beings are. This was the best science of the day. And we still see in the 21st century, we still see versions of this eugenics, this racial science. It had a corollary and that was that white people were gonna be extinguished, that these darker races were going to overrun the white folks. Another idea the Klan push that continues to have salience in the 21st century. There are other issues and very quickly and briefly, the Klan was a very important general reform organization to make America better, uh, often talking in terms of taking America back to the better times in some pre-existing age where things were much better. Usually, and this is a standard part of the golden age thesis in America, a time when, <clears throat> when white men had power and no one would question that power. Uh, one of the Klan's major issues with reform, this is the period of prohibition, the Klan spent a lot of time and energy on trying to bring about the enforcement of prohibition laws because they were widely unenforced across Indiana and across America. The Klan was also deeply engaged in the behavior, especially of young people, of young women. Their sexuality, uh, evident in the flapper with the short dress and the shimmy dance and all sorts of other things, uh, evident on, on the Hollywood movie screens in big cities and small towns like Logansport. And of course the Klan reminded it's people that these Hollywood movies full of this sex and outrageous uh, disregard for convention. These films were of course made by Jews in Hollywood. I like especially the way in which the Klan picked up on what was happening on Indiana Avenue. It's certainly the hippest best part of the whole state in the 1920s, many young folks would say. Uh, uh, outraged in particular by what later would be well, later what was always called miscegenation, the mixing of the races, young white women uh, dancing with, and God knows what else, black men. These are a proud people. I spent three years working on this book, reading Klan speeches and newspapers and other documents, trying to listen to the voices. Some of them, some of them were charlatans. Some of them joined for all sorts of selfish and and, and silly reasons just because it was fun to join because it was good business to join. But I came away convinced that most of the people who joined the Klan, these good Hoosiers, believed in most of these values that the Klan was preaching. They were not embarrassed. This group in a small town standing between the American flag and the Christian flag with their masks up raised have nothing to be embarrassed about. They are American. 100% Americans doing God's work, doing the work of America. And included among them were women, perhaps half the members of the Klan were women. We don't know as much about them, which is usually the case, but women played a very important role in, uh, in building public schools as bulwarks against the spread of Catholic parochial schools, of cleaning up corruption and sin in their communities. Very activist women working as members of the Ku Klux Klan. This was a sophisticated organization, as American as apple pie in its outstanding business practices. This is the Klan manual. This copies in the Indiana Historical Society Library, a detailed listing of how you recruit members, collect dues, run meetings, conduct a Klan funeral or a Klan wedding a sophisticated, well-run organization that knew how to put on performances. None better, none more important than Klan parades. And there were hundreds of them across Indiana in the 1920s, massive parades of road marchers, always with the American flag, uh, the lit cross. Uh, here we have always a band, a marching band. The big parades had several marching bands. This is widely regarded as the best marching band in Indiana, the Klan band from Muncie. Here they gather ready to march off with their purple capes, even the saxophone player in the front here. 
Klan bands, Klan parades, and Klan rallies. This one in Kokomo on July 4th, 1923, a massive rally. Thousands of Klan members from all over the Midwest gather. Uh, perhaps the largest Klan rally in American history. They knew how to put on this kind of a show. The Klan had its own sheet music, its own songs. It made its own phonograph records. These at Jeanette Studios in Richmond, Indiana, where Louis Armstrong also made phonograph records at the same time. The Klan made its own films. This one, The Traitor with Wind, showed at Cato Tabernacle, one of the, the biggest venue downtown Indianapolis, and across Indiana, in movie theaters, in church basements, and in other venues. <clears throat> the Klan had its own newspaper, The Fiery Cross, published every Saturday, distributed across the state, uh, the Fire Cross is digitized. If you're interested, you can you can read it. Uh, for my sins, I spent many, many, many hours reading the Fire Cross. Uh, you can do keyword searches if you're interested in a particular subject. Uh, I chose this issue to lead us to another point, and that is the Klan relationship to politics. Because any organization like this, with this kind of agenda, is certainly going to get into politics. And by early 1924, the Klan was ready. Their treasures were full, their organizational structure was hierarchical down to the, community, the county community level. They could turn out voters, they could select candidates, and they did it with a precision and a sophistication that resulted in victory in the fall. Victory for Klan candidates, victory for Republican candidates, because here's another major partnership. In addition to the Protestant churches, the Klan partnered with the Republican Party. There were some Democrats who were Klan candidates, but mostly it was the Republican Party. In 1924, the Klan elected a governor, Ed Jackson, the worst governor in Indiana history, I believe, and a majority of the state legislature. There was opposition. Uh, Catholics led in forming the American Unity League, but others joined, uh, arguing this was an American fight, rightly so. Uh, the American Union League, Unity League had its own newspaper uh, to contradict, to challenge the fiery cross. Uh, African Americans organized the early formation, formation of local branches, the NAACP, as the Klan began, played a very important role in opposition to Klan strength. There were Jewish individuals and groups who stood up, though it was very hard, as it was for African Americans to stand up and challenge the Klan in Indiana in this day. Here's one of the best known and greatest of them, uh, Rabbi Furelich from Indianapolis, who, who was just brilliant at attacking the Klan with, uh, with intelligence and wit. Some newspapers, uh, the Indiana Bar Association, but by and large, I have to say that the opposition was very slow to form and it was very slow to become powerful. Uh, there were not enough profiles in courage. There was too much silence, easy for me to say, a hundred years later, but that is what we have. And so the Klan decline was slow and very painful and very troubled. As late as 1928, uh, Republican Klan candidates won most elections in Indiana. And this was three years after the Klan Grand Dragon D.C. Stevenson went to the Michigan City Penitentiary for the rape and murder of Madge Oberholzer. I've got a whole chapter on Stevenson. I, uh, my, my B in my bonnet is too much attention on Stevenson takes the spotlight away from the fundamental issues that are most important and most relevant for the Klan in the 20s and for our understanding of it today. So what happens after 1930? Let me make just a few quick comments about this. Let's go to the basketball court because some of us are gonna leave this and go directly to basketball tonight. And as Hoosiers, we're kind of crazy about this subject. Here is my favorite basketball player of all time, Bill Garrett. There's a very good book about Bill Garrett from Shelbyville, Indiana uh, called Getting Open. When Garrett played, whether in Bloomington or Ann Arbor or Evanston, he was the only African-American on the court, one and only one. And then I always like to follow with this, just a few years later from Garrett's distinguished All-American career, Coach Branch McCracken could not find a single African-American player worthy of joining his Indiana University team. 
Of course, by this time, by the time Garrett was playing, the civil rights movement was beginning, coming to full visibility in the 1960s, a very powerful and very important part of American history. There's a tendency now, I think, to denigrate this and to say, well, you know, they didn't really do enough. They didn't succeed. Well, all of that's true. They didn't do enough. But by golly, they did a lot. And I believe the civil rights movement, the legislation, the changes in culture and politics uh, in all aspects of life is a very, very important part of moving America forward in the 1960s and beyond. So I have great respect for those who marched like this and in many other quieter ways carried forth this movement at the local grassroots level. level. It's not just Martin Luther King. It's many, many thousands and millions of others. But that movement, in fact, was so successful that it created a backlash. And I want to talk a little more about this because I think this is very important, too, for our own time. In 1964, in the Democratic presidential primary, a candidate from Alabama showed up in Indiana running in that Democratic primary, George Wallace, the segregationist governor. And here in front of his headquarters hotel, the Claypool in downtown Indianapolis, African-Americans from the NAACP are protesting because Wallace, while he didn't talk in Indiana like he talked in, in Alabama, Wallace did pioneer the politics of rage against all the things that were wrong and all the ways in which white Americans were being denied their rights. Wallace also pioneered uh, what we today call dog whistles not using the N-word, but everyone knew who he was talking about when he denigrated certain individuals, certain kinds of Americans who were not 100%. I want to also draw your attention to the figure standing waving the flag. You know that, of course, as the Confederate battle flag. It's a controversial emblem. Um, uh, I think it's very clear what it means from the very beginning. And that is in the 1950s, when Southerners discovered this flag and raised it as their flag of heritage, they were actually raising the flag of white supremacy. There are some who don't know this, their ignorance prevents them from knowing this, their willfulness perhaps, but this is clearly the flag of white supremacy. And I would add to that, as the great great grandson of a Confederate cavalry veteran, I would add to that the flag of treason a disgusting symbol. Nothing personally offended me quite so much on January the 6th as seeing that flag inside our nation's sacred Capitol building. And so what happened? Wallace is an example of with the civil rights movement, the creating of a backlash, the creating of space for white supremacists. And this third clan is almost exclusively white supremacists. They have other enemies, Jews, LGBT people, immigrants, Muslims, et cetera, but it's mostly about white supremacy. Uh, and the Klan, uh, Klan members, individuals, attempt to hold meetings and rallies and organize in Indiana, but they get no traction. Always, in all these marches and, and gatherings from the 1960s down to the present, the number of people opposing the Klan, demonstrating against them, far outnumbers the Klan. These folks really are the great unteachables. They are marginal. They are powerless. In some ways, we should, not, we should not allow them to distract us from the main issues, though they do, because that clan robe and hood is so powerful in our minds. Uh, we cannot look. We cannot help but be anxious when we see it. I like this, uh, this image. Uh, we've got the fellow in the front. He's got the Klan insignia on his upper shoulder, the, the, the flag of white supremacy on his sleeve. And then to the left, there's a Klan member who never had a good class in grammar and doesn't know how to spell the word it's. You all know there are two ways to spell it. This way is not one of the two. So I like this, uh, I like this photograph. More seriously, here are three individuals watching those unteachables as they march by in 1980. I don't know who they are. I don't know their story, but I'm gonna make up a story for you. I'm gonna focus on the woman in the middle, embracing her son, field glasses in hand, watching these people going by, thinking about the story she may have been told <clears throat> by her mother, by her grandfather, about what the Klan did in Alabama or even in Indiana. 
and thinking more importantly about what she's going to have to tell her son when he's 14 years old, or especially when he's 16 and wants to drive a car. She's going to have to have the talk, that painful talk that Black families have with their children. There was violence in this third clan, the firebombing of the black market in Bloomington, and most tragically, the murder of Carol Jenkins in Martinsville. Neither community has fully recovered, Martinsville in particular, from those acts of violence. There are other more recent acts of violence and intimidation, and doubtless, we're not finished with this in America. And of course, there was Charlottesville, the Klan member on the left with the same insignia with the blood of Jesus at the center. And on the right, more powerful, more important, more meaningful in our time, the militia, <clears throat> the men, mostly men, in militia gear, in combat type gear, ready to do battle. This is Matt Heimbach from Paoli in Southern Indiana, very sophisticated college graduate, not an unteachable, knows how to use the internet, knows how to travel through Europe organizing as well as through America, and who played a major role in organizing the Charlottesville rally of 2017, when the former guy said there were good people on both sides. <clears throat> so here's my thoughts, opinions, and you can have others certainly, on who the Klan's descendants today are. We're not finished with this story. <clears throat> It's different in so many ways, but I think these are the kinds of people I would, find, I would look to as descendants, embodiments of the Klan ideals of the 1920s translated into 21st century forms. People so certain that they are right, that they are the good people. People who denigrate the rule of law. People who think there are 100% Americans and there are others, there are them, those other people. People unwilling even to contemplate what white privilege might mean or how it might apply to the lives of individuals or groups or a nation. People who are fearful of changing times. I watched those, a lot of the women's basketball games. You know, I played basketball when I was in high school. We could never imagine, never have imagined for a minute that girls could run and dribble and shoot the way Miss McDonald did for the Arizona team and all the others. We live in changing times. Always we live. That's one thing a historian knows. Always we have changing times. <clears throat> and I would ask us to think about perhaps less the people in militia gear and certainly clan robes and hoods and the well-dressed well among us, the well-dressed among us who can speak, who can text, who can say things and write things that maybe have a little more coded language to them, but embody fundamental clan ideas from the 1920s. I don't know how to solve these problems, <clears throat> uh, but I'm a historian. And I think always the answer is history, education more broadly, a good liberal arts education, in fact, and history. I love this sculpture in the Meyer Gardens near Grand Rapids, Michigan. When you can travel again, I recommend a trip there. It's a wonderful place to visit. This is, a sculpture titled Listening to History. The human figure cannot see. The cords bind close the eyes. The ears cannot hear because the book of history is bound over the ears. What we need to do, I think, is cut those cords and open the many, many books of history and read not the fake or patriotic history, but the history of all the glory of this nation and the American people and all our tragedies. And rather than telling ourselves bedtime stories that make us feel good, as citizens of democracy, understand where we've come from and where we are and where we wanna go. This is my email. Uh, we have some time, I hope, for conversation, but if you wanna send me an email with a, with a, a direct question, uh, I'd be happy to have it. And I always end with a picture of my grandchildren uh, I know there are no better people on the face of the earth, and I really, really hope for their sakes, for their lives, that the arc of just, that the arc is bending toward justice, that Abe Lincoln was right when he said that America 
not as the greatest nation, but America is the last best hope, best hope of the world because of our ideas of liberty and justice and equality for all. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm finished and, uh, and the floor is now open. Dennis? Thank you, Jim, for that uh, clear and insightful excursus of a complex history and uh, at the same time, very evident uh, history. Uh, perhaps it, uh, we should note that, of course, we're gonna finish in time for people who wanna go see the basketball game to do so, but uh, the nature of the game tonight is one that might offend some of the early Klansmen, right? It's a Catholic university. Yeah. How can Catholic boys play basketball? <laughs> playing against the playing against Protestant uh, university, right? So you know, the Klan claimed that, uh, that the Catholic high schools in Indianapolis in the 1920s were recruiting what they called Negro boys to play basketball mm -hmm. and allowing them to smoke. The Jesuit priests allowed them to smoke as part of the recruiting device of, of Catholic of these Negro boys and turning them into Catholics and then sending them to Notre Dame. It was all part of a great conspiracy that had basketball at the center. Yeah. <laughs> well, conspiracies are, are everywhere. I should make a note uh, for those who may not be aware, Ed Jackson, to whom you referred as the governor of the state of Indiana, was a speaker at the dedication of uh, Temple Bethel in uh, 1925 at, um, in downtown Indianapolis uh, as the governor of the state at that time. And his message emphasized the fact that there shouldn't be any such thing as hyphenation. Hyphenate. Hyphenate Americans. So an American is an American. But he did speak at the, at, at the congregation. Um, how would you explain that? I, 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 you told me that some time ago, Dennis, and I believed you, but I also am a historian. So I went back and read the newspapers and you're absolutely right. I, it's astounding in a way. And, 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 you know, why did the rabbi, why did the folks there invite him? I mean, he gave a certain credibility as the governor of the state, but he was also a widely known clan member. So, uh, Human beings are not consistent, are they? Not at all. It's a, something worth exploring a little bit more. But um, uh, you should uh, invite, I'd like to invite you all to post any questions that you might have in the chat. Or if you have an urgent question and you raise your hand and I can see you, uh, I'd be pleased to invite you to, uh, to pose a question or make a brief comment. Uh, Marsha Goldstone, unmute yourself, Marsha. They can't, Rabbi. Do you want me to unmute her? They Did you can't. unmute her? Yes. Okay, but unmute Marsha, but I'll, I'll let you know when to mute her again, okay? Go ahead, unmute Marsha. Unmute, okay. So my, thank you so much for the, uh, the great lecture. So my question is whether or not you have information about other states in the 20s, were they as susceptible to the Klan as was yes. Indiana, or was there something special about us that made Hoosiers just be enraptured with the Klan? Well, that's a, that's a very important subject. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk. Um, as I said, the Klan was everywhere, but it was more popular, more powerful in some places than others. Uh, we don't have, uh, there's not a book like mine for every state, but there are some states that have books like mine, even maybe as good as mine, I don't know. Uh, Michigan has a very good book on the Klan in Michigan, um, but but we know from all sorts of evidence the Klan was very powerful. For example, in Ohio, it was very powerful in Oregon, it was very powerful in Colorado. Uh, it wasn't quite as powerful in Michigan, and you get down in the weeds on this. There are some likely reasons why that was the case. Uh, however. Indi there was no state in which the Klan was more popular than Indiana. Indiana was not the only Klan state, but it was among the leading states with Klan presence and particularly political power because uh, I argue in the book that, that there was, that, that maybe this generation of political leaders in Indiana in the 20s uh, was the worst we've had. That's, that's claiming something, but, but they were just mediocrities. 
Uh, there were no profiles in Courage, but they were just placeholders and out for, for you know, the graft and the, 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 the worst of political stuff. And none of them had the gumption, the stuff to stand up to the Klan. There were lots of Indiana Republicans who knew this was bad. We shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be going to bed with the Klan. This is going to bite us. And it did, of course. Uh, but they just didn't have the qualities of leadership to, to step up. And so there was a vacuum. And the Klan very astutely and very skillfully filled that vacuum and became, for a time, very political politically powerful in Indiana, unlike most other states where the Klan could not gain that level of power. Well, Jim, I know you know this story, but I think it'll interest everybody about uh, Lou Shapiro and yeah. his response <laughs> to, to the Klan, which, uh, I mean, I find that very interesting because here he is an immigrant and just starting a new store uh, and he makes a very strong statement against the Klan. He decides after he sees them marching down uh, Meridian, I guess it is, yeah. uh, then he says, what do you mean I'm not American? I am American. And he, he decides to put up a sign which says kosher grocery store just uh, to spite them. And so I, you may know more than I do, but I- Well, I, I, there's a wonderful article in Traces, the magazine of the Indiana yeah, Historical that's Society. Where I found it. And, and uh, I haven't read it for a few years, but my memory, Sandy, is that I think it was called the American Grocery Store. Yeah. And right. when the Klan appeared, Mr. Shapiro decided to heck with this and named it Shapiro's Kosher. And I think he put a Star of David in the front. Yes, 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 yes. That's an act of real, Courage, and maybe it's a smart business move too. I mean, I've always I've loved Shapiro's for decades. And when I was working at the Lilly Company doing the biography in the archives, there, I'd I'd walk over there for lunch most days of the week. <laughs> I think that the Lilly, the the, the Lilly personnel was the mainstay of Shapiro's. Uh, I think so too. Yeah, there were a lot of them there when I was working in the eighties. Interestingly, Shapiro's was an active member of Congregation Beth El Zedek. Oh, I didn't know that. So even though, uh, even though the governor spoke there, Shapiro uh, mm -hmm. countered uh, civic. I wonder if the governor went there for anything. You know. I wonder if he did. Uh, could you say a question? Too, okay. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to call a, a question, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about eugenics, because yeah. one of the um, uh, sad facts of history is that. Um, much of the eugenic enterprise of Nazi Germany was learned from the American experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was it was an international scientific community that, that created eugenics. Uh, there was lots of work going on in Britain and Germany and, and across the world, but the American scientists certainly were a, a very, very central part of the science, in quotation marks, of eugenics. Um, of course, it was it was a harder sell in America than it was in Germany, uh, and uh, uh, easier in Germany to sell, easier in the 1930s to sell, uh, because of the I think I think because of the great um, we would say multiculturalism today in America. Uh, in most American cities in the 1920s, you looked around and you saw all kinds of people from all over the world and some of them you went to school with. And are you going to put that person at the bottom of the racial hierarchy? But there was also opposition to eugenics in America. I don't know enough about Nazi Germany to say how much there was. I'm sure there was some. But, but the eugenics movement, which was very popular, uh, did have opposition from within the scientific community and outside the scientific so it had great power, but it, it never, it never uh, dominated without, without opposition. Thank you. We have a question uh, from Michelle Greco. Um, she asks, in the South, the Democratic Party was the party of white supremacy until the 60s. Why was it the Republican Party in Indiana that the Klan teamed up with? The Republicans had been the party of Lincoln, so why were the Indiana Republicans the Klan allies? Uh, in the 20s. That's, a, that's a good question, and I think it's it has to do in significant part because the leaders of the, the, the both parties in 1922, 1923 had intense debates and lots of back car, correspondence about what to do. 
whether to oppose the Klan, whether to go along, whether to be silent, whether to, to join. Uh, and there was within both parties all sorts of opinions on that subject. I've got a whole chapter on this, and I find it a fascinating um, conversation that's going on within the parties. Uh, the Republican Party um, was, was more the party of native born. The Democratic Party was always, by the late 19th century, the party of immigrants. Uh, however, the Republican Party was the party of African Americans. This was a real trauma for Blacks because they had voted for Republicans since the days of Lincoln. And now all of a sudden their party's taken over by the Klan. And for the first time, for the first time in 1924, African Americans in Indiana vote Republican, uh, the beginning of a shift. The Democratic Party, of course, becomes, uh, you can't say the Democratic Party stands up against the Klan. Well, the Democratic Party decides officially in its planks is to just be silent, not to condemn the Klan, though they have a little bit of words of, uh, well, we, we believe in, in America for all. Uh, but the Democratic Party becomes then, as the Southern Democrats, as the questioner suggests, uh, begin to have immense influence in the party uh, in the 1930s. And the Democratic Party moves to uh, uh, to strong segregationist racist positions uh, that, that struggled, you know, continues with Lyndon Johnson and, and the blowback after uh, 1968. And we're still living with all of that stuff and it's all tangled up. But uh, uh, each of the parties has had to struggle with this. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Question from Tracy Mishkin. Uh, would you recommend James Lowen's book, Sundown Towns, for yeah. people wanting to know more about Midwestern racism and the Klan? Yeah, I think I think those books are useful. Um, and he has there's a website, and you can and it's updated. Uh, uh, it's kind of crowdsourced. Uh, I I find that uh, they're useful in introducing you to the concept of Sundown Towns. These are towns for those of you not familiar, where the assumption was that African-Americans in particular had to be out of town before the sun went down. This was an all white community. You're coming here to work or whatever, but you're gonna leave uh, before the sun goes down. And uh, we have in Indiana history, many, many, many such towns. And we still have some today. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them sundown towns uh, accurately. Uh, my only, my only uh, caveat with uh, the Lowen project is that uh, in my use of the of the documentation, some of it is uh, is not well documented. Some of it I think is misleading or even actually wrong. Uh, it's a good step to begin if you're interested in a particular town, especially uh, in America, uh, including Indiana. But I would I would follow up with your own research to make sure that you can you can be accurate. Yeah. The um, the concept that you described about Blacks being permitted during the day, but having to return to their uh, residential areas at night is exactly how the European Jewish ghetto operated. Uh, yeah. Jews would leave the ghetto during the day, but they had to go back. And in some, and in some cities, the preeminent ghetto of all was in Venice. And that's where the word ghetto comes from. It means mm -hmm. the area of the iron foundry where the Jews would live. That's what the word ghetto means. Uh, they had to go back and it was locked at night and then opened in the morning and then they come up, could come out again. So there is history behind that. There is a question uh, from Jeff Bublik. In America, what was the Klan's plan for perceived undesirables? Just to dominate them into submission, to frighten them, to relocate elsewhere or what? Well, it was, it was the latter. It was the less, the less stringent, the less, the less uh, violent. Uh, the Klan, uh, I've never seen the Klan calling. I, I quoted that speaker, put him on a raft, but he wasn't serious about that. They never seriously proposed uh, anything close to extermination or removal or, or any other kind of um, extreme measures. What they wanted to do was make sure that those people, not 100% American, knew their place and stayed in their place because some of them were getting uppity, the Catholics especially. Catholics in the 20s were starting to move toward middle-class status. There were more children, even grandchildren of Catholic immigrants. And they were saying, hey, wait, 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 we're Americans. 
we want a slice of the pie. We don't want this kind of discrimination. We can work and go to school and do everything other Americans can do. And so that kind of behavior, and there were some African Americans and some Jewish Americans, I suspect, who were beginning to behave that way, even though it could be dangerous, for blacks especially, it could be dangerous. Uh, and that kind of, of rising up from those not 100% Americans really, really concerned the Klan. And they wanted to make sure that everyone knew, all the good people knew who the not good people were and made sure that they stayed in their place. You began to uh, address this issue towards the end of your formal presentation, but I wonder if you would uh, be a bit more explicit about the present political and racial sensitive moment that we are living in America right now? Well, Dennis, I wish I had the, uh, the answers to this. I've, I've pretty much decided I'm gonna write a textbook for high school kids on this subject. Um, it's called Hoosiers and the Long Struggle for Racial Justice. See if I have it in me. I'm, I'm saying this publicly, so you can come back and tell me I, I need to do it. Um, so I've been thinking about this in a lot of ways and thinking about how you talk about these subjects to, to ordinary people. Um, um, I, I'm deeply, deeply concerned. I've always for personal and other reasons been interested in issues of race. I'm deeply concerned today and I never thought, I never thought we'd be in such a bad, bad place as we are today in my opinion not just on race, but on, on all the related issues, the issues of the clan, of us and them, of who's 100% and who's right and who's not. And um, it, as a citizen, it grieves me terribly. That's, that's the bad news. But the good news is this. Uh, I, I'm not alone, I think, in seeing possibilities. In seeing the last 12 months especially, uh, younger Americans in particular, and I think we have to hope the younger Americans really step up here as they did in the 60s, um, in the Black Lives Movement, in other movements, in a wonderful organization called Women for Change. <laughs> oh my goodness, are they fantastic. And I spoke to them and yeah. So, and, and those are examples. My recommendation. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> I gave you 10% of my fee, didn't I? Of course. <laughs> I didn't check for that, did I? Oh, well. I didn't uh, hear about that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think there are lots of signs of hope uh, that, that we're, we're never, we're never going to solve these problems. They are ongoing always. This is the nature of democracy. But I do think that there are reasons, lots of reasons for hope in our time to name, not just from the White House or other political leadership, but across our country, especially at the grassroots level where the important things really happen. Thank you. I, uh, Pearl Regenstreif uh, has a question to ask. <clears throat> Jackie has to unmute her. Jackie, you need to unmute Pearl, please. It takes just a second, give me a sec. She's up there. You see Pearl's iPad with the yellow hand there? I see the hand. <laughs> well, we can't unmute it yet. Pearl needs a hand to be unmuted. Pearl, are you there? You want to type your question or you want to speak it? Oh, I, see her. Her. I think we lost her. Perhaps the hand was just a hand of approval and not well, not I a question. Okay. She Hopefully she'll come back. Okay, right anybody now. else in the meantime while we search? Um, yes, Myron, we need to unmute Myron. Okay. So we can unmute them, but then they have to unmute themselves yes. too. Because Myron. of the settings, we have it set that not everybody can unmute. So when once I prompt someone to unmute, they yeah. have to reciprocate and unmute. Okay, so Myron, could you unmute yourself now? You need to unmute yourself now. Okay. Okay. There you go. I think I'm mapped. 
Jim, uh, it's wonderful to hear you again for about the seventh or eighth time to us. And it's always new. The question I have, or actually it's a comment, you uh, made a line to some of our contemporary uh, politicians, Josh Harley and um, um, Taylor, the, the two uh, right-wingers in, in the House currently. And it's amazing to me to see more than that theoretical string or relationship because in your third slide, I think it was the third one, where you showed the marchers with their signs and it said, wake up white America. And that has now been translated to the concept of woke po policy. Uh, I, and I think that that's the code word that the uh, right is using now. And we should acknowledge where it may have come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Myron, that's a, you've always been one of my best students. So thank you. That's a, very, that's a very astute comment. I didn't think of quite all of it that way. But yes. Um, yeah. You know, uh, well, first of all, I didn't, I didn't mention uh, the names of those two individuals that you mentioned the names of. I'm trying to be fair to everyone here, yeah. but um, why, why beat around the bush? Yes, of course. Um, it grieves me especially with uh, Mr. Hawley because he was a history major who studied with one of the finest historians in our country at Stanford. He knows better. He just knows it's not true what he's saying most of the time. Um, I, I, I love the concept of the word and the concept of woke as though we didn't know what was going on before 12 months ago. And we just discovered now what, what, uh, that, there's, that there's discrimination and racism and prejudice in the world. I mean, I, I try to be sympathetic and not an elitist academic, but where in the hell have you been? What have you been reading and thinking? Who have you been talking to all your life to just wake up now and discover that there's police violence against blacks, that there's anti-Semitism, that there's homophobia, that there are all these other ills. Um, but I'll take whatever we get. And so I'm happy that some people are waking up and I just hope they stay woken up. That's one of the problems with changes. You know, people drift in and then and they find other enthusiasms, so. Would you venture a comment on in what ways this period of uh, pandemic and quarantine may have impacted on the awakening uh, uh, and, uh, of America? That's an interesting question, Dennis, and I, I, I know no more than anyone does about that, less probably, but you know, I, think, I think from what I see, what I read, we've all been reading more uh, we read no, more media reports, which is probably good. We're reading more books. There are more nonfiction books now being read. There are more serious books of, of history and politics coming out, and some people are reading them. Uh, but what we're not doing and what we need to do, of course, and Sandy and I know this from Indiana Humanities, one of the other great organizations in our state, is to read, think, and talk. And we can read and think, but we can't talk with each other. Uh, we can talk on Zoom and that's good, but it's not the same as sitting in a coffee shop or a bar and having a conversation. The kind of conversations uh, that we all need to have uh, to test out our ideas and our feelings and our thoughts, and especially to have conversations with people who are not like us. One of the things I read a lot in recent, in recent times is you've got, you, you, you've got to get out of your own comfort zone and talk to other people. How many white people have African-American friends? A simple question has been asked a long time. The answer is not very many. Well, I think we have covered a great deal and uh, you have um, taken us through a, uh, a guided tour of a, a very important chapter in uh, 
or chapters in the history of our state and of our country uh, with which we have to continue to contend. Uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us who gathered tonight. And um, perhaps if you didn't do so yet, you'll raise a little uh, cup of wine <laughs> and toast uh, L'chaim to a new generation and to better times uh, for everybody. Health and joys, and don't forget to go out and uh, pick up this book and read it. And we look forward to other opportunities of having our dear uh, distinguished uh, friend uh, and uh, teacher of Indiana, uh, Jim Madison with us again. It's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Thank you. Bye, Sandy. Bye. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Sherry, for keeping us connected and thank you all for joining us.